There's really big problems that we need to deal with in the space, and then if we come back to forestry, just in terms of how we manage forests and how we do things. We do have the ability to, to manage them and the skills, and we just need to kind of agree on that broad vision, which I think we can. So I guess I'm, I'm pretty positive about this stuff always, but positive, but, but not complacent, I hope. Welcome to The Regeneration Will Be Funded. I'm your host, Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're having conversations about regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. How can we build an economy that's in service to life? Brought to you by Ma Earth, you can find all of our conversations at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Today's guest is Peter Hanford, founding director of Ground Truth, a leading New Zealand forestry and land use consultancy. In this discussion, Peter offers his bird's eye view into the forests of New Zealand and a vision for how we can improve in the future. I ask Peter several questions about radiata pine, which is the most commonly used tree in New Zealand forestry and he offers a nuanced perspective as well as some historical context, which I really appreciated. We also talk about funding challenges, things like carbon and biodiversity credits. And I asked Peter about his daughter, Sophie Hanford, who's made quite a name for herself in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and what he's learning from the next generation. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Let's dive in with Peter Hanford. Welcome. Today we are here with Peter Hanford. Peter is a forester and the founder of Ground Truth. Thanks for being here, Peter. Thank you. Yeah. So let's start a bit with your background uh, across forests. I know you've done a lot of work around biodiversity monitoring. Um, maybe share a bit about your experiences. Yeah, thanks. Um, so my background um, came into, I guess, started going right back. I guess I was, you know, like, quite a few Kiwis, I suppose, just spent a lot of time in the outdoors, so a lot of time in native forests and that sort of thing. And um, from school, I went into the wildlife service for a short period, so working on um, endangered species work, those sorts of things. And then from that, um, went into training as a forester, um, but with my interest in those days was strongly in the management of native forests, I guess. But over time, spent more and more time in managing um, exotic forests. And so I suppose my career has been a little bit unusual in that it's been blended between work in conservation biodiversity and work in primary production systems around, around forests. So that's kind of evolved mm -hmm. into what, we've been doing as a company in terms of really whole land use and trying to get all of those different components of forestry, biodiversity, agriculture working together rather than being sort of in separate boxes. Right. Yeah. Right. And just to set forth some some definitional terminology, when you say exotic, what, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, that's a un, funny term, isn't exotic it? Exotic <laughs> for us. <laughs> that's right, it sounds quite exciting. It's yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess non-native, mm -hmm. I suppose, is what we're talking about, really. So, so yeah, just um, introduced species. So that, <clears throat> but it covers a whole range from. Um, you know, radiata pine to redwoods mm -hmm. to eucalypts to all those sorts of things. Um, but I think a, a useful thing just to talk about and clarify at the start too is that forestry in is is the whole management of trees and, and forest. It's not so it's it goes right from establishing and managing native forest for biodiversity through to um, clear fell radiata pine forests on sort of easier country. So it's I guess I think, and, and also the other, so it goes in that width, but also I guess in the depth from, um, you know, providing services around soil and water protection to recreation to 
mm-hmm. um, biodiversity to timber products to honey to fungi, all those sorts of things. So it's a very, in its um, international sense, it's a very broad right. field. And, and broad so someone expertise. from the outside might hear forester and think someone who cuts down trees. Yeah, or well, they might think radiator pine, mm-hmm. clear fill, whereas actually it's it's someone that has their, their knowledge is around understanding what, uh, trees and forest ecosystems and how you manage those to right. to get the best out of them. Right. And radiata pine, can you kind of offer some perspective on like what is radiata pine for especially those out, outside yeah. of New Zealand? Yeah. So um, radiata pine from Monterey, from California. is so. But, it, but basically there's a little bit of context history that's quite useful, I think, is that um, New Zealand – Back in, would have been, I think it was the 20s, there were some very far-sighted foresters who at that time realised that we were we were harvesting all our well, native forests and overcutting them and, and basically um, taking them for timber without really looking at how they were managed long-term. Mm-hmm. So they did a lot of work looking at those forests and looking at modelling and saying, well, we're, we're going to, you know, we haven't, we can't keep doing this. We're going to wipe out the whole lot, and we're not going to have any timber. So they, so there was from about that point, there started being quite a, a strong movement of research and planning around what what could be a replacement, mm-hmm. and and then so started looking at different species, and then radiata pine was one of the ones that was looked at and performed really well. Right. So that, and then not long after that, there was the you know the nineteen thirties, the depression. And one of the ways that the one of the tools that was used to kind of provide some economic development and soak up employment was to get people out establishing mm-hmm. forests. So that was when the Kangaroa forest in the central North Island was established with radiata pine. So mm-hmm. so that's kind of <clears throat> we started this trajectory and then there's lots more and more research gone in around radiata pine as a mm-hmm. as a species in its management. So so that's um so that's the kind of, I guess, a little bit of context in terms of how it's sort right. of developed in New Zealand. But, but some other interesting kind of aspects around it. If you look at um, forests and, and ecology, radiata pine is basically a, um, it's a sort of a primary species, and it, it so it tends to um, regenerate after a disturbance like a fire or wind or that sort of thing. So it kind of grows up. Um, a big event comes along smashes it down, then it regenerates sort of in large mm-hmm. patches. So that's sort of its normal ecological process. So it kind of means that that sets you up a little bit in terms of how that species, how it's going to work, mm-hmm. as opposed to other species. There's all sorts of, you know, like, say, redwood, which is grows for a very long period, very stable, mm-hmm. shade tolerant, they, it performs differently. Right, because so. a forest is not a static thing. It's very much about succession, and yeah. you have to think about it over time. Yeah, and different species have different niches and roles to play in that succession. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, and and that's that's the that's where the kind of expertise and the knowledge and the skill comes mm-hmm. is understanding what you're trying to achieve, and therefore what species and how you should manage and and how that fits in the whole landscape. Yeah, and I think that's where in New Zealand, and it's shown up more in recent times, is that we've mm. um, we've kind of um, got too narrow right. in our understanding, and and I think it's sort of um, our kind of knowledge base as foresters has got is, is meant that we've sort of got a little bit blinkered, and and mm. we should have been setting ourselves up for these situations better than we have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I have appreciated our conversation so much in terms of some of the nuance and empathy I have. And like, for example, that history of how radiata was brought in to somewhat, you know, help stop the forest uh, yeah. logging of, of old growth native forests, yeah. you know, yeah. and what w- might have happened had the country not done that. And um, yeah, when I got off the, the boat, 10 years ago here and just looked at the landscape of just huge monocrop pine plantations and just kind of hitting myself over the head like what are they thinking (laughs) why are we doing this you know and then paying people over here to pull wilding pines out of the ground and we have all these beautiful native trees and like so i think it's easy to have a knee-jerk reaction or um 
maybe a simplistic view mm -hmm. and you know i think that uh, yeah. getting further into that in this conversation is is part of what i'm excited about but first i want to ask you a little bit more about ground truth right and just just to contextualize for people listening like w what is that how many people are involved yeah. yeah so um currently there's around about 30 people mm -hmm. involved um and as i'm saying it basically I, I originally started in it as as a forester and doing biodiversity and sort of things. But I worked with um, another business partner who's now in the company from very early on, mm. um, John Paul Pratt, who's actually an agricultural scientist. So he's done a PhD in agricultural engineering around mm -hmm. minimum till systems, direct drilling and that sort of thing. So we worked together as research officers and we, we basically had this conversation about, well, this is not since, you know, I'm working over here in forestry, you know, but we we right. want to be doing the same, you know, we, we're trying to do a whole landscape thing. So we sort mm. of, we chatted about that and then uh, quite a few years later when I sort of set up the initial part of the business, he came and joined. Mm -hmm. So, so and then, and then we've basically, that's been our kind of approach of bringing in people that have those different um, skill sets and different knowledge. So we're trying to um, work in a, in a holistic way as a team. Um, mm. So when we're doing projects, we'll have someone with forestry expertise, someone with agricultural, horticultural expertise, someone with um, ecology, biodiversity, and, and try and nut things out. As, so we're doing the whole holistic approach. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, I think the other key point is that uh, about, it must be 10 or 15 years ago, um, we m identified that really, you know, as we look at, um, managing land and resources, you know, with more pressure from population, everything's sort of getting scarcer and more constrained. Mm. Um, but the one the one thing that's kind of developing and potentially getting cheaper is technology right. around um, the way we can do things. So we sort of identify, well, we need to be in that space in order to get real sort of integration of mm -hmm. what, what are the problems, what does technology need to do, and, and let's start having to go at it. We might not end up being the the world's best in, in that field, but at least we can start the thinking so then we can work with other partners. So mm -hmm. so we now have um, quite a strong technology department that, that works around providing um, app to sort of web database, sort of practical tools in terms of for forest and land managers. So Daniel Barr even leads that team. So there's the three of us again at that level mm -hmm. as directors giving that sort of integration across. Yeah. So, and the other thing with technology, I guess, is what we're we're always saying, talking about technology as an enabler. Right. Like we we don't want to we don't want to do technology just because it's shiny and exciting. We want to do it because we can actually see something that it's gonna it's gonna make easier or better. Or, yeah. Yeah. And, and what are some examples of of landscape projects that Ground Truth has been working on? Sure. Um, some examples would be we've had a very long history um, working in the Manawatu, um, particularly um, with the Palmas North City Council, um, and they have a, a large water supply catchment for their city, provides about 60% of the water to the city, and that's um, that was retired as native forest back in the late 1800s. So we've done a lot of work with them around looking at the long-term restoration of that in terms of animal control and, to, and in particularly in terms of monitoring biodiversity in that area as the animal controls introduced mm -hmm. uh, and also with them which i know is a site you visited with us to ha have a look at was um arapuki forest park so again it's an exotic forest where mm -hmm. there's strong demand for recreation in that area particularly around mountain biking mm -hmm. and an interest in biodiversity and so on so we've worked with them in terms of really creating a, a situation where we have got that mixture of mm -hmm. taking a, a, a radiata pine forest and moving to some native, large areas of native forest restoration and then other species that can be managed in different ways in the long term. So, yeah. so they tend to be, um, so that's an example, but the projects that we tend to focus on and enjoy doing are those ones where long term um, and quite a whole range of different um, values and outcomes we're trying to achieve mm -hmm. land use. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that that site visit with yeah, you. It's yeah. I think part of what got us so excited about yeah. getting your support and help on us thinking through our our little pine plantation mountain yeah. over there and here at Mongrove Farms, and um, yeah, I think that the holistic integrated perspective that you yeah. that you all bring is is really important, and I also really. Um, feel resonance with your technology approach because these tools can be hugely helpful yeah. when yeah. appropriately applied yeah. and uh, like you said to enable different different activities so broadly speaking you know maybe help us understand like what is the state of forests in new zealand as it as it currently stands we talked a little about about the history but yeah. where are yeah. we at today yeah, I think I think we're at a bit of a, a turning point. I think <laughs> nice because um, <clears throat> we have, as I said, I think as I sort of introduced before, we have become um, quite quite narrow in our thinking. And I, I think this often happens. You know, you get um, investment and in research around mm -hmm. a species and a way of management, and that of course drives more. That's then that's what people know, and then they invest in more research in that area because they know it. So mm -hmm. so you get that kind of like. Right. It's a kind of a natural narrowing down that happens. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think um, we have done that. I mean, and I don't I don't want to knock the value of radiator pond industry because it's basically our, I it's our third largest export earner. It's like right. and, and basically it, it's massive in terms of what it provides environmentally as a um like wood as a as a as a commodity, as a as a natural resource mm -hmm. is environmentally really important to mm -hmm. to where we go from here so um so i think probably what we've done and the way we've approached things to this point has you know probably been the right way to do things but but i think what we've done is we've we've um we've narrowed ourselves down to when we right. get into a situation with particular parts of the country and and major climate events then it's the species and the way we manage it doesn't suit it. And we've tended to kind of up till now go, well, this solution works really well across the whole landscape. And mm -hmm. I think what we're learning more and more, of course, is that it, it doesn't work in some places. Um, yeah. Central North Island, Kaingaroa Forest is, um, you know, ex-volcanic um, sort of pumice soils, um, quite easy, flat terrain. So it's a large scale um, industrial plantation radiator of pine forest works really well there mm -hmm. without without too many impacts but you you shift that system into somewhere like the east coast with major climate events young um, unstable sedimentary soils mm -hmm. um, and you you know you just you're setting yourself up for problems mm -hmm. um, what are those problems well I guess they are you know what we've seen following cyclone, Gabriel. Um, Back but, when Gabriel was a, a, a horrific storm that happened here in New Zealand yeah, early 2023. Yeah, that's and right. we had huge amounts of, of yeah. pine radiata slash, you know, left over from, from clear felling come run down yeah. the, the hills, huge amounts of slips to the land and then sediment runoff. And so that's, and again, like all, a lot of these conversations are, are, very, are very nuanced and mm. we've got to be really careful not to kind of. Um, blame one thing yeah because the the reality is and, and maybe i'll just step back briefly there because if you take the east coast um it was um following sort of european arrival um i guess it was in about the early 1900s there was massive land clearance mm. um on these kind of steep unstable um sedimentary soils mm -hmm. um you know sort of mudstone type sort of soft rock sort of areas so massive clearance of that native forest and then a movement to pastoral farming. And that happened over really quite a short period. And that, as you can imagine, then you've got future events and it created really big issues because you've got um, steep pasture country, mm. it slips and you get massive sedimentation into the into the waterways. So, so again, there's a little bit of history is that there was cyclone it was a cyclone bowler in 1987, mm. which was, um, and you had this pastoral, largely pastoral landscape. You had this uh, another one of these big cyclonic events that come down from the um, from further north into the area, and that created massive um, slips and sedimentation and, and major issues. So, 
there was a rapid movement after that to try and promote afforestation of the area, which was which was an improvement. You've got you, know, you go from a pasture system to radiator pine, and a lot of those a lot of those areas, it's it is an advantage. You're getting mm. greater stabilization, but mm-hmm. but again, it was a little bit like we put it everywhere, right? Um, so so we kind of set ourselves up for a little bit of an issue from that because we were starting to plant it in very steep areas where it potentially slips off because there's just not enough soil depth and those sorts of things or areas where it was going to be really hard to harvest Mm -hmm. because they were down in a deep gully around a waterway or so we sort of got a bit kind of um i guess a bit broad brush with their approach then right um and then isn't there an issue to while we're talking about the problems um, of just kind of approaching it as a one and done plant a bunch of trees all at one particular time and then leave it because you end up with all of the species, you know, or all of the the life in your plantation being the same age and kind of, you know, makes it easier for harvest. But when yeah. I walk into the pine plantations, like it just feels dead, you know, right. other than grazing animals that shouldn't be there, yeah. you know, occasionally running through. How do you think about that? Um, again, it's it's all about, yeah, it, is, it is all about how you manage them. <clears throat> um, so if you have a... a radiator pines or even a lot of species if you if mm-hmm. you grow a a dense stand um so that basically there's not really much light coming in for other species into that area mm-hmm. um and it's um large areas of a similar age but that doesn't necessarily matter because it's about you know your management can vary but mm-hmm. but so you can it is about, I guess it's about diversity at that level. If you manage in a very consistent way and, mm-hmm. and it's not matching what you're trying to achieve, mm-hmm. then it's not a very direct answer, but it's a little bit, almost again, stepping back a little bit, it's like, mm. I guess I was trying to start with it, it sort of thinking about the beginning is forests are a mix of you know, trees and a stand and all of the dynamics and systems that work mm-hmm. around that. Yep. And then as a, as a forester, your knowledge and skills should be about how do I manipulate mm-hmm. that system to get what everyone needs. Right. Um, and so, so let so me ask it. Yeah. H- how well are we stewarding and managing pine plantations for biodiversity? Um, I don't. Th- I wouldn't say that we're. It's at the moment. It's a little bit. Um, it's a little bit not accidental. It's not the right word, but it's it's, it's security. They they provide biodiversity in mm-hmm. a range of situations, but I wouldn't say that we're kind of actively we, we're not about it. being as intentional around that no, particular objective. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm, that's what I guess I was mm-hmm. trying to leading to. Is we sort of need to be more intentional about our objectives mm-hmm. because you can manage a forest two different objectives, but you need to actually agree what they are. I, mean, I guess it's that where you're trying to get to long term, isn't mm-hmm. it really? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm surprised there's not more biting criticism from you about radiata <laughs> the way we're doing it. But this is good. This is why yeah, we're yeah, having well, the I, conversation. I, I think, um, I mean, I guess because it is, in some situations, it's actually okay. And it, mm. and and the thing I don't want to like, you've got to be realistic about is it's a really, um, it's an efficient and cheap way to produce a an environmentally really valuable resource. Mm. Mm-hmm. So like I could say, oh no, we should all go to um, continuous cover mm-hmm. only, and not do any clear for radiata, and and mm-hmm. then, but then our timber production would plummet. You know, like right. you just couldn't produce the same level, and you couldn't produce it at a cost that would enable it to replace other materials like steel and concrete and those sorts of things. So, right. so I kind of think it is a it is a balance at that level, mm-hmm. um, and and I do think that you yeah it it's it's a species and a production system that that can work really well and with low impacts in the right areas. It's just that we haven't, right. we've just tried to push it out everywhere. Um, so that's kind of the current state of affairs, I guess, yeah. is that we've we've scaled up radiata yeah. probably too much. We've kind of narrowed narrowed our focus just mm. to this species. Yeah. We've put it in places that aren't the most appropriate yeah, that's, you know, that's for correct, it. Yeah. A, any other commentary, kind of, you know, 10,000 foot view on the state of forests in New Zealand? Um, I know it's a big question. Yeah, it's a big question, but it's a good one. I mean, it's a, <laughs> as a forester, it's a nice one to be answering. <laughs> <laughs> I think, 
native forests, we have a major issue with our introduced um, browsing animals. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, I don't know how much background people have about New Zealand and forests, but we're in a bit of a particularly unusual situation in that our mm-hmm. our wildlife um, there were virtually no mammals. It right. was just um, basically continental shelf came out of the ocean. All we had were birds here. Yeah, for yeah, and, the longest and a, time. Only, only mammals, a couple of bats, little small bats. So, right. so unusual situation, and and so those animals, that wildlife has evolved very much in in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, <clears throat> then Maori arrived, introduced us a small rat, and then Europeans arrived and re- introduced a, a whole lot more things in terms of awesome. possum, so rats, goats, so yeah. deer, all these things that just have yeah. no predators. And- yeah. So the, and the whole system can not evolve to them at all. So like mm-hmm. you know the forest and the species not evolved to be kind of resistant to browse. Um, the birds, the birds evolved to be. Um, like the, their predators were um, birds of prey, a couple of birds of prey. So the so the native birds have evolved to be. Some of them will have really good camouflage, and there's a few that are nocturnal. So they evolved mm-hmm. to um, to be able to avoid those birds of prey. Some of them, but then you get a, you know, so they're sitting down in the bush hiding, and then a stoat comes along and goes, "Oh, there you are! I'll just go and you know grab you." So they're not, you know, so they they're basically just completely vulnerable to to those predators. So. So I guess in terms of state of forest, that's yeah. that a key thing that we've we've got still is that our the health of our forest is majorly impacted by mm-hmm. by those pests. And the and the, the issue is whether we're in you know, we're we're not really investing enough in managing those and looking after them. So that And that, know, that I don't want to linger too much on this point, but the but the consensus point of view across conservation in New Zealand is that we should um essentially trap and kill a lot of these in, mm. you know invasive species these predators yeah. things like possums and stoats in order to um you know protect the native ecology to try to make sure that these forests can not only survive but thrive um you know there is obviously some concern about that approach yeah, yeah. you know more broadly but is it fair to say that you're kind of within the consensus of that that you think that we should actively manage and try to um, reduce or or eliminate species that um, are currently wrecking havoc on the native ecology. Yeah, I, th- I think you have to, unless you. I mean, otherwise, you, you either it's either that or say, well, we're happy for things to go extinct yep. and for the forest to degrade. So, I think you know yeah. that that's the level of discussion. And then, and then once you've, and I think most people would say, well, we we can't just let all these species go extinct. I mean, just from a. Mm-hmm. Planetary survival, having biodiversity, gives you options, you know. Right. So, um, so if you accept that premise, then you've basically got to look at well, what's the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's the question then: is how do you, yep. you know, how do, how do you achieve that in the in the most yep. acceptable way, really? And I guess it's it's also a fairly consensus point of view amongst you know, call it environmental yeah, and, yeah. and conservation community that we're not doing enough. Yeah. Right. That we need to do more. Yeah. Tra- like we're not really winning yeah. the the battle against you know the genie that got out of the bottle, yeah. Yeah. whatever, fifty to hundred years ago, yeah. with all of these introduced species. I mean, they, and that's an exciting thing that New Zealand's doing around technology. Like our technology in relation to that um, predator control, animal control space is you know there's some because of the um, predator free twenty fifty mm-hmm. vision that was set. Yeah. Um, what that's done is it's introduced. Both funding and I guess just the whole kind of sort of a, a, a bit of an ecosystem of innovation around that space. Yeah. So, so all sorts of things from um, you know a resetting traps and all sorts of stuff that you know I think uh, it's yeah, it's it's kind of worked in terms of it's it's an interesting situation. I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Mm. Where effectively a vision was set, yeah, a vision was set, a bit of money was provided. Mm-hmm. And then that started to kind of create a bit of a snowball effect in terms of um, innovation and right. then people sharing ideas, you know, moving it forward. So Yeah, yeah. Predator so, Free uh, 2050 uh, was also something that was, um, you know, cross-functional between government and philanthropic yeah, community yeah, and corporate totally. and, and yeah. many stakeholders, a great example of, of you know, many, yeah. many groups coming together, including Next Foundation. Yeah. We just had a great conversation with Jan Hania, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Who's, who's played an important th- role in all of that. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think it is a really useful model in terms mm-hmm. of how that's worked. I mean, there's probably a few things you could, you know, you'd reevaluate, but I think in yep. general, um, the way that that's worked is, has been, um, 
mm. be a good example of how you can create these shifts in a in a quite a consensual way, I suppose. Eh? Yeah. 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 Well, it's a great segue into the discussion around vision, you yeah. know, because I think that you and I have talked about, like, what what is the vision for forests yeah. in New Zealand? Like, where are we trying to really go, yeah. given the current landscape? You know, we have this species radiata. We've talked a bit about that. We have the native forests and yeah. some of the challenges. We've talked a bit about that. So, so help us like understand what 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 do you yeah. see as an ideal state? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd probably find it easier to start by thinking about. You know, again, what what we're trying to achieve a little bit, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about the significance of our native species as Taonga for you know the whole whole treasures. all of us. Yes, yeah. treasures for all of us. Um, maintaining biodiversity and managing that is critical. Um, we also we want to um, you know have high quality water. We we um, mm. we have prided and marketed ourselves on that as a nation, but we mm. we need to kind of live up to some of those things more so mm -hmm. so that's important if you look at the future in terms of climate and the problem with fossil um fossil fuel derived materials and and burning fossil fuels then we need wood as a as a um a major sort of part of our economy from mm. in terms of that so i guess what to me you don't say well this is forestry that's what we need we'll whack it in there it's right. like we start, we're saying, well, we've got a whole lot of options we could do here. Let's understand that land, that whenua in detail. Um, what are the what are the soil types? What are the um, what's the climate? What are the waterways? What's the particular biodiversity values? What are the kind of vulnerabilities? What are, you know, all of those things, and then start saying, well, I mean, really, what we want this landscape to do is to function forever. Well, not, you know, in a, I mean, it, it'll change, but it'll mm -hmm. maintain itself around being able to look after those environmental services that we need and also provide opportunity for people and resources. So, mm -hmm. so you need, to, you start with that landscape understanding of that, and then it's putting the right pieces in the right place. So if right. you, so what I would see in the future, if you, if you're driving through the landscape in New Zealand, you might go through um, an area that is, big, say, some broad ridges or um, volcanic areas or whatever that are quite large-scale environments and don't have too much connection with major waterways or those sorts of things. And in those areas you might go through, and that would be an efficiently run, environmentally sensitive for that site, but but an efficiently run large-scale radiator pine operation is still in those right places. Mm -hmm. But then what I would expect to see is as you sort of, you know, like came off that area and started to get onto some steeper slopes with with um, significant waterways below, then I would expect to see that forest changing mm -hmm. with and reflecting that natural landscape. Mm -hmm. So um, going into um, native forest, permanent native forest in certain areas or other areas where there's still potential for production, but it's more sensitive, maybe it's longer term species that are harvested more carefully, um, mm -hmm. smaller areas or individually. Um, and then, you know, as you say, as you're going down into, and, and then that's all sitting within a framework of our really important native forests that are really well managed. So, so you know, a, a framework matched to landscape. And then, mm -hmm. and then also, I guess, another aspect of that is the biodiversity happily move, like the, the those, and the other forest areas are good habitat for native species as well. And, mm -hmm. and that that's given thought and managed that way. Right. To so, create the right corridors yeah, for the right and, species to yeah, move or across the under stories or mm -hmm. you know, there's a range of ways that and, and predator control coming through both those spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is start with the landscape. Let's let's look at what, you know, the land yeah. wants at some fundamental level and um, that we have objectives around biodiversity, objectives around water, yeah. clean water, objectives around making sure that um, the human economic needs mm. are being met and that we can make those considerations and balance those considerations. And and, and I, I want to highlight that point you made about the biomass, because I think that one's probably under-discussed. Yeah. You know, what is the role of biomass in our economy and why do we want to make sure that we don't have a knee-jerk reaction to say, don't cut trees, you know, yeah. because actually what we're doing there is providing a valuable service. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, I agree. It's it's under discussed, under under considered. I mean, mm. if you look at if you look at what we do at the moment with with um, fossil fuels, we dig up oil and then we we burn it or we turn it into plastics or or, or those sorts of things. Um, if we basically are using carefully using forests and and biomass in that situation, then we're we're in much you know it may not be a perfect situation, but we're in much more circular mm-hmm. situation. And the, the you know we're we're planting a forest that's as it grows, it's absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere it's um it's it's storing that in that way um i was just thinking about the other day it's quite you know the um trees are like it's like you know you take a if, if you could build something that had a couple of thousand solar panels and then a kind of a um an autonomous carbon fiber factory you know connected to the solar panels and you know it's, it's they're quite incredible in terms of what they do in mm. terms of building building that raw material resource mm-hmm. from um from the atmosphere and from water and nutrients, so right. so effectively, you forests are hugely valuable in terms of creating that that material that is in a much more circular situation. You've you've taken those materials, mm-hmm. you basically then can harvest that timber, mm-hmm. and you can use that for you know if you're using it for in a solid wood situation, then it's replacing um, steel or concrete, whichever a lot of energy involved in their production mm-hmm. and um you know a lot less sustainable in terms of the way that they're used um you know you can use the other thing about about wood as a as a, as a material is that you've got solid wood you can use with it you can also turn it into pulp and then you can make paper and all sorts of kind of remanufactured products out of it as a mm-hmm. as a basic raw material without without um Using the sort of fossil fuel side of it, and and also the life cycle is really good. You know, when you finish with paper, it's you know it's either you can compost it or you can burn it or you can you mm. know there's all sorts of things that you can do mm-hmm. that that kind of close close that loop sensibly. So, nice. so we really need to get um, much um, more sophisticated, I think, in terms mm-hmm. of how we think about it and how we use it. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, to just think like the paper products thing, I, I just think we're, we're starting to, but mm. but you can do all sorts of things, almost like injection molding with, um, with mm. wood fiber and all sorts of stuff. So we should be really looking at those technology options using, um, using wood right. materials and those sorts of things. I mean, I, I often think, and then when you get into these sorts of discussions, a lot of what we're doing often is where we kind of, picking up old technologies but using them in a in a really advanced way mm. so like we used to use like you know you go back and look in through the whatever 30s 40s 50s whatever we you know pa- there wasn't any plastics around right we were using paper and stuff for all that sort of thing but we didn't have you know we had a lower level of kind of technology around some of these things so you, mm. there's a lot of potential to go back right look at some of those things and go well that was actually a really efficient way to do that but mm. but you know we can improve it heaps so, right. so I think there's, I think that forests and wood and you know as a raw material yep. is is got a huge future and it and it kind of needs it needs to have more of one because it because it has that underlying ability to to be a um, sustainable. And, and system. where does the most of the radiata pine today end up? You, know, you mentioned it being our third biggest export. Yeah, yeah, and then that's another thing mm. that we need to do. <laughs> At the moment, it's it's predominantly well. There's some big plants in New Zealand. I can't remember the exact figures, but it's probably in the order of sixty, seventy percent of it's exported in log form. Mm. Um, so at the moment, we we don't do that as a nation as well mm-hmm. as we should in terms of um, sort of either displacing stuff that we use internally that we could be doing with a much more sustainable resource yeah. or um, or providing stuff overseas to do that. I mean, we... we I remember with... Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I yeah. remember during COVID, we were trying to do some construction here and um, talking to some of the builders and contractors and they were just really beside themselves yeah. that we couldn't get a lot of the wood that we needed. And yet every day they would wake up and see <laughs> trucks... Yeah. of radiata pine logs going yeah. past um, down to the port to go ship them off to China or wherever. Yeah. And you're like, we can't build 
what yeah. we need to build. We don't have the right type of wood. We don't have the right type yeah. of size and post manufacturing and everything else. And yet we have all this wood and we're just shipping it out at cheap prices uh, yeah, on the yeah. port to use these huge fossil yeah. fuel driven tankers to go <laughs> way across the oceans. And you're like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you we start. We could probably do this better, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, as to the reasons why that's happening, that's probably a bigger, a bigger totally. discussion. But, but certainly, you can see that that doesn't, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing I think is a, is a kind of a, as a nation, we've been like we, we have often been pretty good at innovation around different spaces, and there's there's some great timber things that we've done, mm -hmm. um, like out of the University of Canterbury, their engineering departments um, developed these basically large. Um, timber um, buildings that have tension cables through them. Mm, nice. So they're basically um, awesome in an earthquake situation because the whole building can kind of twist and rock around and, right, and right. pop back into shape. So we, you know, there's situations like that where to me we should be like selling the whole technology. Mm -hmm. Like we should be kind of contracting with someone in, I don't know, um, South America or wherever, or California, for example, and saying like, we'll, we'll provide you the building. You know? mm. Um so yep. but but we at the moment we, we don't do that sort of thing. So right. we should because we, we need to be utilizing our kind of knowledge and innovation and, and almost it's almost like you can embody that knowledge and technology in the wood. Yeah. Because it's you know it's arriving in that. Nice. So, yeah, it's tricky with only five million people. Yeah. You know, you gotta like kind of pick your battles of yeah. what are we gonna get good at? But it seems like this shift from you know, commodity ag, commodity, yeah. you know, timber yeah. into more value added products and yeah. services has been clearly a conversation that's been happening for some time. Yeah. <laughs> and we probably just still need to keep at it, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. I think that's right. Yeah, I don't I mean it is I mean it seems it's it's logical that that um we are a you know fundamentally a primary industry mm -hmm. driven economy, but it's you know, people as you say, it's the it's the technology and the nous around that. Mm -hmm. So it's the combination, I think, of, of the technology in that space, but also the the value add to the material. We just, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I mean, and I think in the same way, the, um, the management of the land and resources, like knowledge around that, is a really logical space for us to get really good at. Yeah. Um, and be able to, you know, kind of support provide support to that internationally, I think. Is a yeah. That's one thing I loved <coughs> about when I visited the site in outside of Palmerston North and go to the entrance and there were all those different types of wood yeah. that you had planted and yeah. that were in the forested areas. Um, and then there was descriptions and explanations of like, this is a good hardwood for these types of building yeah. things. And this is great for floors yeah. and ceilings. And, da -da -da -da. Yeah. Like, and it, it just brought more of an immersive relationship yeah. in of like, what am I looking at? And, oh, this is what it could actually be used for. And there's differences between all of these different types yeah, of trees. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then, you know, actually going through the landscape was stunning because yeah. you felt like you, you were in all of these different yeah. environments and the trails have been really well maintained yeah. by the mountain bike club and the council. And so you could see kind of community engagement yeah. and participation yeah. and pride. And yeah, I just, I feel like that was a glimpse at the future. Yeah. You, no. know? you know, that's a really good point. And I think it is like what I found with that project and with others like it is that it is really but often really hard when people are staring at, say, a, a cutover pine site and you're saying, oh, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be, and, but it, <laughs> right. but, but it's once you get a site to that point mm -hmm. and then people can say, oh, now I understand. You're like, no, totally. you know, that, and that's, that's where, um, that's where things kind of need, um, I don't know, mentors or, some, you know, they need kind mm -hmm. of backers that, that are, that are going to like, mm -hmm. when others are sort of knocking and doubting that they'll kind of push them through to that. To that point where everybody else can go. Oh, yep. Yeah, no, I see mm. what I see. What that was all about. Sort of. Yeah. So yeah. So. And I guess part of the ingredient for that is patience. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I mean, that's one thing coming from software and yeah. then, you know <laughs> dabbling in this whole world of forests. And uh, my brother Brian and I, we would look at these Excel models and stuff and be like, you know. 30 years, 50 years, <laughs> like, I mean, I'm, I'm used to planning by month or maybe yeah, quarters, yeah, yeah. maybe years, but yeah. like, oh my gosh, you know, you really yeah. got to be, yeah. 
uh, making decisions that have multi-decade consequence. Yeah. 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 And what, what else about that paradigm, you know, stands out to you and, and how well are we doing that in terms of that kind of long range thinking? Yeah. Um, not anything like as well as we should, obviously. Mm. I mean, the one thing I'd just say is a little, I think uh, a thing that foresters and people trained in that, I think have a, should be utilizing their skills more because they are, you, you're kind of trained in that space. You're always thinking like you're sort of thinking 30 years minimum. You're having mm-hmm. to, and if you've got a plan at that level to um, to really make things kind of happen over right. time. So I think that as a kind of a profession, I think it's quite useful that, that mm-hmm. those people are used to that, used yep. to that space. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think one of the key things around this sort of long-term planning is that we've kind of got ourselves a bit stuck in a model of how we evaluate projects mm-hmm. too. So we, you know, like if I just take the forestry example, we do discounted cash flow analysis, which mm-hmm. is gets a bit dry and boring. But basically, but effectively what you're doing is that you're, um, you're discounting revenue that's in the future by an mm-hmm. annual interest rate effectively. So you, so you, you just... Right there, and then you're saying, "Oh, the future's less important," you know, right. which is which is fundamentally kind of, you know, a bit of a, a flawed approach. So, but what that means is that as soon as you start looking at a um, a system that will take a bit longer to establish, mm-hmm. and it might give you big benefits, but they're further out in the future. Mm-hmm. As soon as you apply that economic modelling to it, then that that kind of project looks less attractive than the one that will give you kind of something fast but not as good. Right. So, so we really need to kind of um, be more have our eyes more open in terms of what we're doing with with mm-hmm. those things, what we're really kind of setting ourselves up for. Um, right. And I don't hate that. That's where it gets quite difficult because you're getting into a yep. you know a relationship between a kind of an economic model and political systems and stuff. But we but we definitely need to get better at that. Otherwise, we're just right. digging ourselves back into the same hole the whole time. Yeah. And I mean, this series is called The Regeneration Will Be Funded. <laughs> so let's talk about that that funding, because yeah. I think that, to me, is really the crux of yeah. one of the key issues yeah. about yeah. transitioning our land use, right? So see how well I can summarize, and then you tell me what I get right, right or wrong. <laughs> but, you know, essentially right now, you have radiata pine grows really fast in the first 20, 30 years, yeah. like sequesters a bunch of carbon, and then that's that's it. You know, it's basically standing, but it's not a yeah. long-lived tree. And um, and then you have a native forest, and native forests, as a generalization, grow slowly, and but you know you could be around for hundreds of years, right? And so once you get out past your, I don't know what it is, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, you start to really accrue a lot of the benefits had you planted the mm. native trees mm. versus if you had just done pine radiata. Yeah. Um, and this is you know highly simplistic, but. Um, then when you apply a financial model to that, and especially with carbon credits, um, you know, how much is a dollar worth in 60 to 70 years versus a dollar worth in 10 or 15 years, highly sensitive in that model is your discount rate is what, what are you, the percentage each year that you're applying Mm -hmm. to discount. So is, is a dollar in 50 years worth 50 cents or is it worth 10 cents? Or is it worth ninety five cents to you now? Or is it worth a dollar twenty? <laughs> right? Like, you know, do we yeah. actually increase yeah. the value ecologically yeah. because we know from yeah. a climate perspective that we're gonna really need standing yeah. native forests? Yeah. Um, and so we have capitalism's output of these Excel models with yeah. discounted cash flows, and we have, you know, well intentioned efforts around emissions trading schemes and ETS, carbon credits, et cetera currently in a situation where the financial incentive is abundantly more favorable to yeah. put another generation of pine radiata into the ground mm-hmm. than to plant it out in the native forests. Yeah. How did I do? Um, very well. Yeah, okay. I have to say. Okay, um, good. And I've, <laughs> I've just, You're I mean, just being I, nice. Yeah, yeah. No, but I've, I've got it. But no, they're very good, very good um, coverage of it. And, and I guess just a few things I'd just sort of like flesh out or expand on a little bit was... Nice. Um, one is I think that it's interesting to look at the just ignoring whether we should be planting heaps more radiata pine at the moment or not. But but if you look at what the something like a carbon credit or a biodiversity credit does to a forest and its economics, mm. 
is huge because at the moment we, if we're growing a forest just for timber production, what we do is we have, we start this year and we're doing, we've got planting costs, then we've got some tending costs, we've got a whole series of costs through to, mm. we don't get any revenue until we get to age 30 and we cut it down and sell the logs. So therefore, we, if we apply that discounted cash flow thing, then that it's not that attractive because mm. you know it's it's attractive enough, which is why forests get planted anyway. But mm -hmm. but it's not huge returns. But if we then say, well, yep, you can do that, but also you can get um, every year for starting from about year five, at least for the first kind of fifteen years, you can um, get an annual amount of money from mm -hmm. selling carbon credits. Mm -hmm. Then that vastly changes that economic return. Right. So you might go from, say, making um, an internal rate of return if you're just doing um, timber of, say, let's say 6% mm -hmm. on that investment over that period. But if you put in um, that carbon, it might be 20 or 30%, you know, so it's just an insanely high return in, in the in the current market. Mm -hmm. So, But I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that um, it's just an example of, in a forest situation, if you want to get um, established a forest that has those values, then putting some income through the rotation makes a huge difference to the economics of it. So, so those, and that's and that's why we've got into this problem now, where um, we're getting a lot of concern about the amount of um, farmland that's going into radiator pine forest mm -hmm. because because those the carbon credits value has made such a difference to the economics that yep. it's. Um, it's it's ended up kind of meaning that it's attractive to do forestry in areas where possibly from a landscape point of view we don't really need to. They might be quite good to maintain in pastoral farming. So yeah. so And I mean you have foreign owned absentee landowners buying up farmland, blanketing it with pine radiata, you know, that where it doesn't belong. Like, I mean, it is a real problem, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think and and the thing is if you make a if like I'm explaining earlier on that, that sort of nuanced view of how it should be. Mm -hmm. But I guess if I'm, you know, if I'm just um, only concerned about the economic return and so on and I'm sitting in another country, I'm just going to go, well, just slap the whole lot of radiator totally. and get the, you know. Spreadsheet says this is yeah, a nice that's profit. Right, go, do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and that's oh, that's not what, what, it shouldn't happen that way. Really mm -hmm. what you want, what you, ideal world, you want people to be going, um, well, you want a process where basically across our farm landscape, like we've done quite a lot of modelling work, which suggests that a good approach in the current sheep and beef farm landscape is to put possibly up to 30% of those farms into forest mm -hmm. in the right places. Right. So ideally what we want is investors coming in and saying, oh, I want to I want to buy into that. I'm going to support that 30% right. of forest in the right places. Right. Um, so you need... You need and we talked about this a little bit before, and where you need a, you need a mechanism in terms of how you make that happen. Like mm -hmm. if you just have blatant, do what you like, mm -hmm. then it's just driven to to the oh, yeah. e easy option. So, so that's so the space we're in now is mm -hmm. that we need to come up with a way to right to to make that work. Yeah, you and I were talking about how it's like you know policy and regulation defining the upper and and lower limits yeah, and yeah. bounds and then let the the more yeah. free market approach yeah. within those bounds That's do right. its thing in terms of driving efficiency and yeah, scale. absolutely yeah yeah so okay you mentioned you know highly sensitive to the transition income um I think mm. that seems to be the crux of the issue right is like what are we what are those streams of income in those early yep. years to drive different types of holistic mm. uh, land use approaches yep. uh because right now that income isn't necessarily existent yep. um so so take me through a bit more of like what you see could happen here and um also you know as context like we have uh, a lot of discussion around the emissions trading scheme right now and the role of different forests mm. included and not included and mm. um, different incentives and then we also have this new discussion that is out in public comment around biodiversity credits, yeah. um, which is obviously not that new. It's been a conversation mm. for a long time, but I think it's heating up. Yeah. So yeah, what what are your comments on yeah. this? Well, I think the ETS side. If I just start with that, I think the mm. that's been like so. New Zealand's developed that ETS has been in since two thousand and eight. So we've actually developed um, quite a history around using it, and I actually. Um, Fundamentally, I think the way it's set up and the way it's administered is quite good. 
Mm. Um, like the process in terms of <clears throat> that you have to um, prove, you know, the entry of your area and that it was forested after 1990, you know, the, the sort of processes around that mm -hmm. and the, I guess, the credibility of it being a government-based system, I think that's really good. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's also... Um, what we've learned gives us opportunity to kind of think about how we apply that to other systems like biodiversity credits or how we even possibly piggyback them together or, you know, this. Mm -hmm. so we've got, I think we've, we need to say that we've got a, a really useful chunk there. Um, I think that the thing that's interesting and I think it applies to probably any of those credit systems is that to me there's kind of, there's two bits to it. There's one is you, you have to define and administer what the kind of, um, the sort of um, additive thing that you're doing is. So you've got to define that you're actually r really adding more sequestration of carbon, that you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere. So you, you need that mechanism around that. And it's the same with biodiversity. You're gonna, And it's more complicated with biodiversity. What are, what are you actually doing in terms of management of that forest that's giving a sustainable long-term benefit in terms of its ability to maintain populations of different bird species or maintain a diverse forest understory or, you know, ha you need a mechanism to d define that first. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing, which is kind of um, tricky in different ways, is um, the the actual trading of that um, and how you, like we just like you were just saying before, how, you, how do you kind of put bounds on that or control that? Because you can see, as we are just discussing with the ETS, that because we've just sort of said, well, here's the carbon credit and um, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, it's offsetting, whether you're reducing your fossil fuel use or you're planting trees or whatever, mm -hmm. this is the value. So you can end up with a, um, the value going up to a point where it it um, makes, it almost provides too much return in terms of land use change. Mm -hmm. um, and... I guess with biodiversity, it'll it'll potentially be the same depending on what the values are. I mean, a value could be too low so no one does anything, right. or or too high and it creates kind of possibly right. problematic changes. So, um, I think it feels to me like yeah, that those are the pieces that we need to understand, and and I think we're grappling at the moment with the ETS where we we've kind of not um, controlled that. I mean, my my view. In, at the moment in that space is that um, I think there's logically a differentiation between um, credits within the ETS and, and administratively it's quite straightforward to do because of the way the systems run. So, you know, you should be um, stuff that relates to actually reducing fossil fuel usage should be like um, worth a lot of money because fundamentally that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Really the... Um, the sequestration through forests is a is a sort of a tool on the side to, mm -hmm. to assist in the short term. It doesn't it doesn't fix things in the long term. Right. So emissions trading scheme yep. is trying to do you know hey how do we put a higher price on fossil fuels yeah. so that we use less of it yeah right and then you know also how do we incentivize carbon sequestration yeah. through yeah. forests and land use and by trying to do both of those objectives with the same yeah. credit. Yeah. It may actually, you know, fail yeah. to. Well, you, you're overvaluing that one and undervaluing the, you know. So basically, how it should work is that your 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 focus should be on like what we need to do is just stop using fossil fuels. Mm. And if you don't watch, you create everybody's focus goes around the how I can make money out of fiddling around with um, credits, you know, or how right. I can, you know, if, if, if the worst case scenario. So you kind of right. need to, um, to me, we need to come up with an approach that. Um, sets the right boundaries around that. And this, that's where some of the talk is. It's not, I don't know that it's widely supported at yep. the moment, but but to me, I think that there's, when you do the modeling, you can kind of see the levels at which the economics um, mm. are appropriately incentivized. You know, like if you look at radiata pine, like you're probably at 30 to $40 a tonne, it's still a big incentive. Mm -hmm. But when it gets up to 60 or $80, it's just kind of, you know, really kicking things sort of too far. Yeah. Um, if you look at native, you probably like some of the initial stuff we're looking. You probably need like maybe 135 or something. You might need something of that level mm -hmm. to make it to a point where it's kind of economically viable to mm -hmm. to um, establish native forest for carbon. Um, yeah. It may not be that you know. There's lots of those numbers are real. 
yep. relativities only because there's lots of variability yeah. around those. But but it's kind of if you, you see the sort of the situation. Um, totally, and and I guess it, it speaks to the heart of like capital seems to want to be fungible and to find liquidity pools and move around and be multi-purpose. And so it's like, you know, one type of credit, let's make it tradable. Let's make it have derivatives. Let's be able to do, you know, this for emissions and this yeah. for, you know, and it, it's like money seems to want to move like that. And then yet a lot of what we're trying to do, I think is say, no, we need to recognize that there's many different forms of value. Yeah. We need more pluralistic approaches. Yeah, yeah, we need to yeah. break apart, you yeah, know, much, whether it's yeah. social value, ecological value, yeah. financial value, and so forth. And yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm noticing that this is a, a repeating yeah. tension. It's a real interesting, I mean, because it's a real, and it is a tension between complexity and, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Because if you don't watch, you kind of, you get so complex, no one can understand what's going on. Totally. And then, Which is already a risk with a lot yeah. of this stuff. So, yeah. So I think I think that's that is difficult. Yeah. So what do you see like in your world uh, as an ideal vision for the biodiversity piece, given that you've been on the ground and yeah. have actual experience monitoring biodiversity? I'm, I'm really curious. Like, are we in fairy tale land, thinking that we can kind of really track and measure and kind of you know quantify in a way that's productive for these types of credits, or do you feel like there's a there there? Um, I th think it's feasible. But I think I think uh, some of the discussions and talk I think is is, is going a bit far and being a bit unrealistic. Mm -hmm. I think I think there's probably um, yeah I think I think there's scope to start simple in terms of even things like um, like if you take for example it would be fairly straightforward to say um, uh, if a forest is um, has stock excluded and has these animal pests reduced to a certain measurable level, which we already know how to do, we mm -hmm. do that sort of measurement day to day, mm -hmm. um, then it's it's uh, uh, this sort of credit, you know. Mm. Um, so um, that's, I mean, that's just the kind of, a, you know, what they often talk about is this sort of, a, it's kind of um, activity-based monitoring, so it's just sort of saying what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can also measure things like, you um, the diversity of the understory of species that are vulnerable to being browsed. Mm -hmm. So we can measure things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think I think you could set up, a, um, you know, there's a, there's a range of things that we could set up that would contribute to it. So I, so I think it's doable. I, nice. I think, but but I think we just need to. Um, I would kind of. I mean, I haven't thought about it in great depths, but but to me, I can see potential that we could use a lot of the mechanisms of the ETS. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the kind of administrative and record keeping and mm -hmm. sort of approach that's in there, um, and then we could start reasonably simple in terms of what we tackled in the biodiversity right. space, right. and that would give us a whole of a lot of um, of you know kind of experience and ability to go forward. What do you think about the tension of where this is really governed between kind of at a at a country level versus at like more of a local council level? Um. I think, I think the degree it maybe even helps with that potentially because mm. um, <clears throat> if you do set a more standardised credit, then at least at one level you're talking about the same things. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it could assist to do it more at a nation level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it provides. It's not going to be the only thing, but at least at you know right. at one level you're talking about the same thing mm -hmm. rather than sort of different different views on that. Um, and I guess well, in New Zealand, <clears throat> I mean, the ecology is similar enough across places mm. that we can, you know, like you said, get to some pretty basic first primitives around yeah. grazing of stock and, you know, yeah. these types of things. Yeah, I mean, there's some pretty fundamental problems in terms of browsing and that sort of stuff that I think mm -hmm. you could, you know, you could, or predators or those sorts of things that right. we could focus on. Well, the other little comment I was just going to make, the one sort of thought I've been having yeah. a bit recently is around, um, in the particularly more in relation to the ETS and carbon credit space, is that another possibility, I don't know how it would work there, is, is just creating transparency in terms of the credits that people are using. So if you've got a business that is um, having to meet, you know, an emitter that's having to meet its requirements under the, mm -hmm. under the ETS, if you made it a requirement that they disclosed what credits they were using for what, mm -hmm. That could be helpful as well, because if you've got right. investors can then say, well, this outfit's only using yeah. radiator pine credits from for their, to meet their requirements, or this one here's actually 
very deliberately pushed their fossil fuel um, mm-hmm. stuff right back. And you know, so if you could create some more transparency like that, I think mm-hmm. to to give a consumer signal, yeah, I think could could be helpful as well. Yeah, and I think that's one of the clear <clears throat> advantages and value propositions of, of distributed ledgers and blockchain technology in this space of carbon credits. And I think a lot of people are clear-eyed about, you know, how do we create transparency to the life cycle of credits and, you know, the usage mm-hmm. of retirement or trading and right. be able to kind of look at a credit and go, where did it originate? Who made those decisions? How was that methodology, right. you know, decided upon and who validated the credit? Where What was the life cycle of the credit? And you, you can't really do that through regulatory administrative paperwork globally you know across the supply chain but you can if you're all using the same ledger system in terms of the the fundamental tech yeah i mean that's i mean obviously i don't the 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 blockchain sort of things Mm. which i've had discussions with people out the in the past and i'm gonna gonna rope you into that world slowly but yeah yeah yeah, no i'm I'm interested i'm interested but i i'm a useful skeptic probably initially Mm. Mm -hmm. because i because the the concern i have is the complexity again yeah but but i don't but that's probably because i don't understand it enough you know so at the moment, I have a complexity about does it just become a murky thing and I don't understand it, but I'm sure that's not the case once I actually knew what I was talking Maybe. about. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I mean, I think that uh, I see it like a like a, a new public utility right. where it's like, you know, the electrical grid or railroads, right. um, you know, when you only had it a little bit of the way there. Uh, it's not that useful to people, yeah, yeah. right? It's 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 only useful once you have enough scale of the grid or yeah, of yeah. all of the railroads connecting that then you can build the ship cars and you know connect different cities and put supply chains and, through. And it. Presume, yeah, and just and people's understanding of how, I mean, yeah, people's understanding of how stuff like that works must be the yeah. It'll become very modular, very like yeah. simplistic at the user experience level as this infrastructure takes full hold. But you know, we've been in basically. Uh, uh, in infrastructure enablement phase for the right. last you know yeah. 15 years yeah. and still still to go but if you go into the the engineering mechanics of what's happening in the infrastructure phase if a lot of 10 to 100 x is kind of stacking in terms yeah. of s- speed scalability interoperability etc and you have hundreds of thousands of the smartest computer scientists cryptographers around the world all kind of you know, coalescing around a shared a shared right. set of systems, yeah. and I wouldn't bet against that. Yeah, 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 I'd, yeah. I mean, so I mean, I guess from I'm just thinking from a user point of view, what you kind of need to be able to, I, I suppose, I suppose how it would work. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm derailing the conversation here, you. Can. No, it's great. It's great. <laughs> we talk a lot about Web three. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I mean, I guess what I want is user experience. Don't I? So if I go to if I go to decide whether I'm going to go with a certain power company or mm. buy a certain fuel or whatever, something like that, I I need to know, well, I want to know that this one is um, mm-hmm. somehow much better than that one. I need, I need to know that exactly. really kind of right in my face, don't I? That sort of, so, so that, yeah. I guess that would enable, yeah, you would have, yeah. And, and, and I mean, we had a great conversation with a guy named Alan Ransell from Filecoin Green. And, you know, there's people working at an even deeper level than just ecological credits around how does data become more verifiable yeah. on the internet right. um, <clears throat> and attestations and how this is applied to uh, supply chain reporting mm-hmm. requirements right. and just general, um, yeah, like supply chain infrastructure so that you can understand the footprint and the data and the monitoring and so forth yeah. across the life cycle of things. Um, but again, abstracting that um, verifiability to systems of protocols rather than to um, lots of different intermediary right. uh, administrative layers on top of it. Right. So can, can you actually make the addressability of content and data itself something that can be you know verified and and this is gets into like the cryptographic magic that's happening that's right. really underpins this yeah. whole revolution which is yeah. um it's a computer science set of challenges yeah, and things yeah. that are cha- changing the nature of the architecture of the internet now i'm getting really way yeah, off yeah. topic but um, no, no, it's, watch yeah. this space you know yeah, we yeah. actually are interviewed a few folks about this so you'll have to check yeah, out yeah. the episodes yeah yeah no but i mean i guess but i mean it is an inter- as you say it's a it's not to go too deeply into it but it's a, it's the interaction is is, mm. is fascinating i mean the other you know like to derail it even further <laughs> <laughs> but the sort of i mean again i'm just 
um, have no knowledge or understanding really at all. But but in terms of the relationship of AI to these totally. aspects, in terms of even just the relationships of um, resource management mm-hmm. and managing natural systems, yeah. I think, I mean, I can I I. I have a, a small glimpse that I can see how significant they could be, but yeah, but in terms of, but that, but that's got to be, totally. that's going to be a huge space in terms of how good or bad or yeah. ind- indifferent it is, isn't it? Really, over the next little while, I'm, I'm imagining. Yeah, and I think you know that brings home for me a feeling I have about forestry in general, which is, if you look at the convergence of exponential technologies across, mm. you know, blockchain, AI robots mm. and synthetic biology yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is extraordinarily hubristic to think we know what's going to happen over the next right. 30 to 50 years <laughs> like you just if you have confidence that you know so it's like so how do we hedge our bets or find the the core principles mm. of things that we can like kind of go you know it may be that we can print trees out of labs and synthetic wood materials and so it may be that the demand <laughs> function completely changes right like we don't know like i mean there's experiments at mit that are showing the the real promise in this arena um or it may be that you know there's robots roving up in the steep eroded hill areas and and doing a lot of forestry management and so our labor costs you know financials and and i think to me then it gets back to like the real basics of like you know that's a waterway these are the yeah, yeah, trees. that's right. Those issues are still going to be there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're still going to have those fundamentals. Right. Yeah. And the other thing, which is again, would even derail the conversation further, would be <laughs> is the the whole fundamentals of um, our kind of ethical models and stuff. You know, which mm. which we don't. You know, totally. we, which we to me as a society, we 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 just haven't mm. put attention to. You know, and and this stuff is just completely challenging. That isn't it, really? Because mm. it's like I don't know anymore. What's right. <laughs> Totally. What's, what's upside and downside and what's... You know. Right, right. <laughs> so, and so yeah. that's a, a great segue into the final question right. <laughs> I have, which is, you know, you are a, you are a, a parent. Your oh, yes. daughter is a bit right. of a legend, Sophie <laughs> Hanford. I've been watching her for some time. She helped organize the school strikes for climate yeah. here in New Zealand, yeah, yeah. mobilized tens of thousands, well over 100,000, yeah. um, you know, students and youth to... Um, yeah, make their voices heard around climate. And then she, Sophie, became the youngest or one of the youngest ever yeah. counselors uh, yeah. of the Capiti Coast District Council, yeah. um, where she manages portfolio across climate change and yeah. um, something else. Oh, the youth, uh, the youth yeah. portfolio as well there. Yeah, and she's actually the strategy and leads the strategy and planning committee, effectively. I think that's the name nice. of it. So it's like it's the lead kind of. And I mean, this is, you know, a a very important district council in New Zealand. And so, I mean, you must be uh, incredibly proud. Uh, I'm I'm very curious, like, what what is she teaching you about these topics? Uh, Heaps, actually. Yeah, I am proud. But um, the interesting thing, and I I think there's a number of points to make. One is I think what it's brought home to me is how imperative it is that we get youth into those positions of power. Mm. Um, Because they have both... A different view and a completely different skill set. Mm-hmm. Um, so, some of the things that I've so it's it's an, a really you know not not a situation I've ever envisaged, but it's fascinating. Is that mm. say, so, um, so I'm observing her and how she operates in these situations, and they and I think this is kind of quite a lot of young people are like this. They're way more collaborative, mm. and and um, they. When they're in those, they're, and they're used to obviously used to using all the sort of technology networking systems, just like you know, natively. Okay. So the way that that she operates in a council meeting is just hugely efficient compared to, mm. and efficient, and I think collaborative compared to what you know people of my generation have kind of come up okay. through. Um, so I kind of, at a high level, I think that um, we need to really have a shift in terms of mm. young people jumping into those positions mm-hmm. um, because it's, I think it's like they've got, you know, we're in, we're in this sort of like almost exis- existential crises in terms of climate. So we mm. need that, um, those ones in there that, that really have a stake, much more of a stake in it. Um, mm-hmm. But I just think they've also got skills that are, yeah. in terms of the way they operate is from what I've, what I've observed. So she's teach. So, so I guess she's teaching me, well, I'm trying to learn from you in terms of um, that group 
working with groups and mm. in the way they um, collaborate and acknowledge people and do that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah. And any reflections on how do we bring more youth into those types of positions and, you know, or anything you learned about creating yeah. space and elevating. Yeah, I, th I think, I can't remember who it was. I went to a talk with some youth speaker about it, and he was saying, what I thought was quite a really good point, is he's saying that as adults, it's not, it's, we, we, part of our role is to actually get in there and deliberately help people up into those spaces. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, so it's it's an it's a active thing. It's not mm -hmm. a, um, oh, well, well, it's not like, oh, well, we'll create a youth rep position. Mm -hmm. It's actually we need to be going out and sort of supporting younger people to, mm -hmm. you know, giving them opportunities, mentoring them, you know, just in, in supporting them. Mm -hmm. And also I think um, the other thing is is that changing, I've observed certainly with Sophie, is that there's the kind of reverse ageism thing. You know, it's right. like, oh, it's not a bad idea for a you know young person sort of thing. Mm. It's, <laughs> totally. it's kind of, um, you know, we need to be changing that attitude in terms mm -hmm. of so that we're actively – expecting young people to step up and say things. Mm. So there's a few of those. Does that yep. make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but I think, it, yeah, I think it is, I mean, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's a really, really important aspect of, um, yeah. Yeah. That we do that with younger people. Well, Sophie, if you're listening, we've warmed up the space <laughs> with your dad. Now it's time to come in and drop some real wisdom and <laughs> nuggets into the space. Um, any closing thoughts or comments, Peter? I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, Thank you. No, thanks. Um, I just think that there's there's really big problems that we need to deal with in the space. And then if I come back to forestry, just in terms of how we manage forests and how we do things. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to make light of the fact that there's some issues that we have to deal with, but but I also think that we we do have the ability to to manage them and the skills, and we just need to mm. kind of agree on that broad vision, which I think we can, and mm. then basically just. So I guess I'm I'm pretty positive about the stuff always, but positive, but but not complacent. I hope you know, so we can yeah. Yeah, Thanks. very much appreciating your, your, your wisdom and insights. Thanks again for being with us. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Peter Hanford. As you could probably tell, I was trying to get him to offer a spicy take about Radiata Pine, uh, but I really do appreciate his balanced perspective. If you're interested in this conversation about forestry in New Zealand, I'd love to engage with you more deeply. You can find me in the community discord. Links are in the show notes, as well as on maearth.com. To learn more about Peter Hanford's work, go to groundtruth.co.nz. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.